Hi, my name is Drew and I'm going to be walking you through the Lance 1985 today. Uh, starting right up here on the front of the tongue, we're going to go over the coupling procedure. Uh, you have your release mechanism here. As it sits now, this is going to be the locked position. Your indicator of that locked position is these two vampire teeth uh, sitting flush there in the uh, frame. Now, the unlocked position is going to be uh, pulled towards the rear. It does stay in that unlocked position. Uh, of course, this is the position you're going to be when you start to uh, load your camper. So you're going to unlock it here. You're going to come up here to the power jack. We're going to run that up to it's about three inches above your ball and drop. We're going to center your ball and drop underneath the coupler here. Uh, once you are centered underneath the coupler, we're then going to lower that uh, coupler down on top of your ball. Once you're fully seated on your ball, you can go ahead and slide this uh, locking mechanism forward. That's going to, again, lock you onto your ball. Uh, from there, we're going to cross your tow chains underneath the coupler. So it is state law in Texas that these chains do need to be crossed underneath the coupler. And also it is state law that these, are, these cannot make contact with the pavement at any given time. Uh, so what you're going to do is create a nice little basket there for that coupler to land on in the event of an uncoupling. Uh, so once you are uh, crossed underneath, hooked onto your receiver, you're going to then take your emergency breakaway cable, and that's going to ride right alongside those tow chain hooks. Uh, you will use a third connection point to go ahead and connect these, uh, connect your emergency breakaway cable to your receiver. So important that that does use a separate connection, uh, and you don't want to go ahead and, and wrap it up into the tow chains, which some people like to do. Uh, so once you're all hooked up there, you're, you're, you're locked in here, you can go ahead and use this, uh, this cotter pin there to keep that uh, locking mechanism secure. Gives you a, a little added safety uh, that that's not going to vibrate loose or anything like that. Uh, you also have your seven pin connector here. This is going to plug directly into your seven way receptacle on your bumper. This is going to link your tow vehicle and your camper as one. This is going to give you full function to the vehicle's charging system, braking system, uh, lights, things like that. So when this is hooked up to your vehicle, think of it as one large vehicle at that point. Uh, hopping up here to the Lippert Smart Jack. Uh, normal operation is going to be up or down here uh, with the arrow indicators. You do also have a light uh, switch here. So if you go ahead and push that light, it's going to light up a halo light here on the underside. Gives you a great point of reference if you're backing up to the unit at dark time or if you uh, need a little extra light here to light this uh, area here. Uh, if you were to, in the event of a power loss situation, you do have a three quarter inch manual drive uh, there. There will be a corresponding crank handle inside the unit. It is uh, three quarter inch is a very common thread throughout the camper. Uh, of course, manual drive for your uh, tongue jack here for your stabilizer jacks, for your lug nuts. Those are all gonna be three quarter inch drives. So uh, just something to keep in mind there. Uh, behind there, we have three 20 pound propane cylinders. These are full for you today. You have uh, any two being op any two operational at any given time. And then you have one here uh, kind of on standby. Uh, these are separated by a uh, propane regulator. This is an automatic switch over propane regulator. So what that means for you is if we would have both of these cylinder service valves open that uh, once this initial one was depleted, it's going to automatically switch over here to the secondary one. Uh, you'll know which tank you are initially drawing off of because you have an indicator here. Uh, so if this was pointed in this direction, we'd be drawing off of this tank. If it was pointed in this direction, we'd be drawing off of that tank. Pretty simple. Uh, if, you, if you do not want that automatic switchover feature to be in effect, you're going to have to go ahead and close the uh, service valve of that secondary tank. Uh, and, again, and then again, you have this uh, auxiliary tank here uh, held in uh, with the tension band here. So it is very easy to remove that for service uh, in the event uh, that it needs to be refilled. Uh, this is all covered by this propane cover here on the floor that's going to sit on these tracks on either side and go ahead and latch on. Uh, you can use a backside of a key or a coin or something to rotate that latch. Uh, to rotate that latch, uh, that will allow you to go ahead and, and open these valves, uh, you know, and make connections here on the pigtail. So here we have your battery compartment. 
Uh, we're gonna open that up. The battery bank on this particular unit is made up of two group 24 deep cycle batteries. So you're going to have uh, this same door and slide out tray, you're going to have that on the other side as well. So uh, these deep cycle batteries, these are lead acid batteries, so they do carry a bit of maintenance with them. Uh, what that means for you is two or three times a year, we're gonna go ahead and pull these vent panels up and we're gonna refill with distilled water as necessary. So these two vent panels are gonna wanna come up. Uh, now when drawing, going down the road, you're going to have a couple uh, straps here for the battery. I do encourage you to go ahead and use those straps. Uh, that's going to help keep that battery secure. Uh, make sure that you don't have any issues with that moving around. Also, uh, we do wanna make sure that this is fully closed and latched down in there. It's gonna keep that battery from slamming here into the compartment door. Uh, and potentially opening that up. So something to think and keep in mind there. Uh, down low here, uh, we also have the uh, ac access door for your uh, power stabilizer jacks. Now we're going to have a door just like this here on the other side. Now this side here is gonna be the only one with the power switch. So this is where you're gonna start up. You're gonna go ahead and turn that power switch on and then you can go ahead and put these jacks down. Once these jacks make contact with the pavement, you wanna stop immediately. These jacks are not for leveling. Uh, they are for stabilization. So leveling front to back is going to be done with the uh, tongue jack. Leveling from left to right is going to be done with the tires and what's called a leveling kit. So once you're fairly certain of your level, we are then going to go ahead and run these jacks down. Uh, here in the generator compartment, you have a three quarter inch lug wrench there. That's beneficial if you need to change a tire uh, on the road. Now the unit does not have a jack, so uh, keep in mind that uh, you will need to uh, use the jack of your tow vehicle if you are doing any tire uh, changes there on the road. Also in this compartment you have a battery disconnect switch. Uh, with it connected here uh, you're going to be locked in. You're not going to be able to remove the key. That is going to be uh, the battery will be in the on position at that time. Now if we can go ahead and remove the key that's going to go ahead and disconnect the battery. That's going to completely isolate it from the camper. So uh, any nominal or phantom draws will be off the system uh, in that event. Uh, going on, we have the manual drive here for your stabilizer jacks. That is again also a three quarter inch drive. Uh, feel free to use that lug wrench or there will be a secondary crank handle in the event that you do have a power loss situation. Uh, you can go ahead and manually crank those up or down. Uh, and then bef beside that we have your toy lock. Uh, this is helpful to secure any outdoor equipment you may be carrying with you. It is just a ratcheting adjustable cable lock. Uh, will carry its own set of keys. So it is very helpful there. Um, and then back here we have a storage uh, for your uh, septic components, things like that. It's not very deep, not very big. The only thing that uh, realistically makes sense for me would be like sewage elbows, gloves, things like that. So uh, when it comes to changing your tire, we're going to firstly want to make sure that your jack uh, is going to lift the axle high enough to change that tire. This unit itself does not come with the jack, uh, so make sure that your tow vehicle jack uh, is going to lift up high enough to change the tire. Uh, when it does come to changing the tire, you're going to put your uh, jack directly on the axle as close to the tire as you can without it interfering in your work. Uh, moving on, we're going to talk about tires and, and tire pressure and lug nuts here in just a few minutes. Uh, moving down here, we have a uh, toy lock. Uh, now this is also a Lippert product. This is essentially just a ratcheting cable lock uh, that would allow you to secure any outdoor equipment that you may be uh, storing here on the outside of the unit. So it is a nice feature uh, and again, uh, keys are going to be right there for that. Uh, coming down here. Uh, we have your, uh, your Bladex valve for that, uh, for your freshwater holding tank uh, to go ahead and evacuate that water. It is just going to be a six inch pull on that white handle. It does correspond with a two and a half inch PVC elbow on the back side of that freshwater holding tank. Uh, it takes about a minute and a half to dump uh, your full water holding capacity. Uh, lug nuts and tire pressure here. Um, these tires are going to run a 65 max PSI tire pressure. That's exactly where we are going to want to run the units. Uh, so we're going to have uh, 65 PSI tire pressure. Those lug nuts are going to be torqued to 100 foot pounds as well. Now the manufacturer recommends a retorque procedure. That's going to be the first 
15, 25, 50, and 100 miles of initial travel, we want to make sure that we do go ahead and retorque those down to 100 foot-pounds. Uh, manufacturer further recommends that at the start of each trip there on after, we do go ahead and, and retorque those down. Uh, again, in the event that we do change a spare uh, or we do have a flat tire and we do change uh, a tire, we do need to make sure that we do go through that retorque procedure again. So coming on down. Uh, slide out is in right now, but it is a good time to talk about slide out maintenance. Uh, on each side of this slide out, you're going to find two tracks, one high and one low. Uh, once every 90 days, we're going to use a dry silicone lubricant. Uh, to lubricate those tracks, draw that slide in and out a few times uh, to distribute that lubricant and you'd be good for the next 90 days. Also, uh, wrapping full around that slide out, you're going to find a seal. Again, on that same 90 day maintenance schedule, we do want to make sure we are conditioning those seals. Uh, you do have a separate set of seals there on the uh, inside of the unit because the side seals in both directions. We do want to pay special attention to make sure we are uh, conditioning both sets of seals. Uh, storage here, uh, also in this storage compartment, that's going to give you access to your uh, access to your water heater, the backside of your water heater, as well as to the shutoff valves for your outside shower. If you're doing any winterization or anything like that, uh, you'll want to go ahead and access this compartment uh, and bypass that water heater. And to do so, you're just going to remove those four screws. Uh, we have cable satellite inlet here. So that is just a pass-through cable connection. The designated TV area of the camper uh, is just, again, a pass-through connection to accommodate a park cable service or an aftermarket satellite package. Uh, they're going to hook up on here. And again, just going to pass through to the designated TV areas of the camper. We have your 30 amp, 110 volt power supply here. Uh, as you can see, you have one L-shaped prong here. Uh, this is only going to, your, your power plug is only going to plug in one way. Of course, I'm just using a generic shop cord here, uh, but it's going to plug directly in. You give it an eighth inch turn to the right there to lock it in. Then your particular collar is going to, or your particular cord is going to have a secondary collar uh, to screw down, lock it in further. Uh, no matter the cord, it's going to plug in the exact same. Down below here, we have your dump valves. We have gray for gray water and black for black water. Now they are color coded there to make uh, for ease of use. Uh, gray water is going to be anything that comes from the sink or the shower and black water is going to be anything that comes from the toilet. Uh, these valves need to be in the closed position even when you are hooked up to full-time septic. You use the monitor panel on the inside and only dump as necessary. Uh, connecting your sewage hose is very simple. That's going to connect the very same way that cap comes off. So on the uh, outside of that, that, that uh, pipe, you have four prongs. We're going to uh, line up the keyhole of either the cap or the sewage hose in the halfway position, give it a quarter turn, and again, that's going to go ahead and lock it on. Now, also treat these valves kind of like a vacuum lock. They should never be open at the same time. You want to avoid any cross-contamination or backfeeding issues. A uh, popular option uh, is going to be, of course, once that black water fills up, we're going to go ahead and pull that valve. Uh, once that waste is evacuated, we're going to go ahead and then close that valve. Then a lot of people like to go ahead and pull that gray water valve, allow that gray water to rinse uh, their sewage hose and the shared plumbing between the two tanks. Uh, either way, however you choose to operate, it's up to you. Uh, most importantly, just keep this black water valve in the closed position um, until it comes time to dump. Now up here, we have uh, this black hose bib here is going to be uh, for a black tank flush. Now that corresponds with a jet inside the black tank specifically designed to help blast off compound of toilet waste, body waste, things like that. Uh, biggest limitation of the appliance is there is no check valve within that tank to keep it from overflowing. If you have water rushing in here indefinitely, the path of least resistance is the rooftop septic vents. So I recommend my customers with five, no longer than five minutes with water rushing in here before ultimately relieving the pressure there on the blade X valve. Uh, if you have a friend with you, they can also watch that monitor panel on the inside, holler at you when it, it becomes, you know, two-thirds full, and then you can go ahead and dump it here. You are going to get the best rinsing action if you do allow that black water tank to fill up, but if, you're, if you think that you may forget uh, that you have, that you, you know, forget that you have water rushing in there into the tank, you can always leave that valve in the open position 
of course you're not going to get that rinsing action uh, as well but it's, it's better than nothing so something to keep in mind uh, beside that black tank flush we have your city water connection of course you're not going to want to confuse the two here uh, city water is what you're going to use anytime you have access to full-time running water so in the capacity of an rv park you're going to go ahead and use this city water connection uh, water pressure becomes very important when we do talk about city water uh, this unit is designed to have a working water pressure uh, in between 40 and 75 psi uh, it's very important that we do not exceed that 75 psi water pressure uh, we're going to use a water pressure regulator uh, to make sure we are again staying below those those pressure ratings uh, with any water pressure regulator it's going to hook directly onto the spigot side of the hose and then of course your hose onto the water pressure regulator and ultimately your uh, hose onto the trailer connection here by rotating that connection. Uh, very important that we always do use a water pressure regulator. If you know you have one and it gets lost, damaged, uh, whatever, uh, make sure you go ahead and replace it before taking the unit back out. Uh, outside shower here, uh, we do have access to hot and cold water. Uh, nothing too crazy. You have a hard on off there on the actual fixture. I just encourage you to make sure that you actually have these valves off uh, before loading the hose up. I have seen where people have dumped water to the inside of the camper because of the orientation of that on off switch uh, being directed towards the door. If it's not seated 100% properly, you can shut that door and turn that on. So just something to be aware of. Uh, coming around here to the backside of the unit, we have your six gallon capacity water heater. This is an Atwood Dometic product, uh, is dual source. So it's gonna run on 110 volt electricity as well as propane gas with 12 volt direct spark ignition. Uh, again, access to six gallons of water at any given time. Uh, you can feel free to use both sources. That's gonna give you the highest recharge rate. Looking at about 17 gallons per hour utilizing both sources, 15 gallons per hour uh, only utilizing propane gas, and lastly, 11 gallons per hour using standalone electricity. Manufacturer recommends two very uh, specific uh, maintenance uh, procedures, and that's going to be number one, uh, draining the water heater if it's going to be in storage for more than seven days and number two is going to be purging the water heater or filling or pri excuse me priming the water heater or filling it up uh, before lighting it uh, so to drain the water heater it's very important that we give it ample time to cool down more time than you would think generally at least two or three hours once we're fairly certain of the temperature of that water we're going to go ahead and depressurize it easiest way to depressurize it is going to go to the inside of the unit uh, you're going to turn on the hot side of the fixture uh, and uh, once we have cut the flow of water into the unit, if we turn that hot side of the fixture on, that's going to depressurize the unit. So uh, make sure you have no water flowing in, whether that's city water or potable water, and then turn the hot side of the spigot on. Again, that's going to depressurize this. Once we're depressurized, we're going to come here with a 15 16 wrench. We're going to back that drain plug out. Now that is a nylon drain plug. It is very important that we keep that in nylon drain plug. Couple reasons. Number one, it's a secondary safety feature. If the pressure inside the unit were to gain to be too high, it's gonna overcome those threads and spit that uh, drain plug out like a cork. Also, if you do replace that with say a brass plug or anything other than a nylon plug, it is gonna void your warranty with that with Dometic. And that is something we of course wanna avoid. Uh, so, uh, on the flip side of that conversation, we're going to want to go ahead and prime the water heater. Uh, to do that, we're again going to use the hot side of any fixture on the inside. We're going to again introduce water to the unit. So if that uh, is your city water, we're going to go ahead and connect, make that connection, turn the valve on. If we're talking about your potable water, we're going to flip on the 12 volt water pump. As long as we have water flowing to the unit, we're then going to locate a uh, internal water fixture and again, focus on the hot side of that fixture. If we go ahead and turn that hot side on, that's gonna feed six gallons of water to the unit. That flow at that fixture is going to initially be very bubbly, airy, uh, as it's working the air out of the appliance here. Once that flow normalizes, again, that is gonna be your indicator that you have six gallons of water in here. You can go ahead and uh, operate it as normal. Uh, only other recommendation I make for the appliance is gonna be the addition of a bug screen material. You're going to want to go ahead and cover these vents up further. Uh, that's going to keep any mud daubers or flying insects from nesting in the appliance. Uh, generally, 
that's a big problem for us here in Texas. Uh, not only mud daubers, but any flying insects are attracted to the smell of propane. They're gonna crawl deep within the appliance uh, and make their nest uh, as deep within the appliance as they can, generally even in inoperable. So it is very expensive to have those nests cleaned out once they um, have nested in there. Uh, so again, a little bit of foresight is gonna save you money uh, when it comes to these appliances. Uh, that not only goes for the uh, water heater here, but it also goes for the refrigerator, the furnace, any propane, any propane burning appliance within the unit needs to be protected with a bug screen. Uh, we have a rooftop ladder access here. Uh, on that same 90 day maintenance schedule, I know we talked about slide out maintenance. Uh, we're also gonna wanna talk about structural maintenance. So uh, that's not only gonna include the rooftop, so anywhere on the roof where you have two pieces come together, vents, fans, things like that. Uh, there will be either a certain amount of roof tape uh, or a self-leveling lap sealant. Either way, if you see any degradation in either one of those products, we're going to want to uh, fix that as soon as possible. So if you uh, see any roof tape peeling up, we of course want to peel that up the rest of the way and replace that full piece. If you see any cracks or peeling in your lap sealant, we want to touch those areas up. Uh, make sure we're not having any water intrusion issues. On the body, anywhere where two pieces come together, they're again gonna use a, a certain amount of sealant. Uh, generally, what you're going to find here on the body is gonna be 100% silicone product. As long as you can match what they already have laid, uh, feel free to source that from you know hardware store, uh, anywhere where you can. Generally, the products that we spoke of there on the roof, you're gonna probably have to get those from an RV dealer. Uh, and while you're there, you might as well go ahead and pick up some silicone uh, that's going to match uh, here on the outside. And again, every 90 days, we're checking all the seals. We're doing a 360 degree inspection of uh, all of the seals, top to bottom um, as well. We're going to lubricate those slide out uh, and condition those seals all at that same time. Uh, cut, drop it down low here, we have your low point drains. Uh, these are going to be the lowest point in the unit's plumbing. Uh, so the manufacturer recommends that anytime the unit is going to be in storage for more than seven days that we do go ahead and dump the water from the unit. Uh, number one is going to be that white handle we came to initially. That's going to be a six inch pull towards you. That's going to dump your fresh water holding tank. Number two, we're going to come back here to the rear. We're going to remove both of those gray plugs. You have one gray plug for the hot side of the plumbing, one gray plug for the cold side of the plumbing. Uh, they're low point drains, they're gravity fed, they're going to drain all of that point A to point B plumbing right here from this location. Lastly, we're going to finish up with the water heater and we just outline that procedure, just follow that procedure. Uh, once you've done those three things, you have purged all of the water from the unit, it is ready for storage. Uh, you know, and that's just good general maintenance and also that's going to be the first step of the process if you are doing any winterization. Uh, so further to talk about winterization, uh, once we have purged all the water from the unit, we're then going to remove that access panel from this compartment. So we would remove these four screws here, uh, access this compartment here. We're going to go ahead and bypass that water heater. Once that water heater is bypassed, we're going to introduce the antifreeze to the unit. We'll talk about that further because that's going to be done from the inside uh, directly off the water pump. So we'll talk about that when we get to the inside. Uh, we got a tube storage bumper here. You can use this to accommodate uh, your sewage hose or any really long-term storage or long storage. Uh, does, you know, is accessible from both sides. Does have a, uh, you know, a cap there to keep your stuff secure. Uh, your refrigerator here. Uh, now from a, a maintenance standpoint, there's generally not too terribly much you have to do with these units. Uh, it's not really what we would consider a customer serviceable unit. What we are going to want to do is we're going to protect uh, the appliance again from the intrusion of mud daubers and flying insects. And to do that, you're going to go ahead and screen off these vents. Uh, now, when putting this vent on, we first want to make sure that your hose is directed uh, towards the outside. So this is your condensation hose, and we want to make sure that any condensation is going to vent uh, from outside the compartment. So we line up the prongs there on the bottom. Once those are seated, we're gonna line up these holes here, uh, give this a quarter turn. Uh, often you can either use a coin or uh, sometimes your finger. Um, 
but just give those a quarter turn there. Uh, go ahead and give it a pull, make sure it is locked on. Uh, you don't want to lose this when you're going down the road. Uh, we have your furnace vent here. Biggest thing with that is again going to be the addition of a mud dauber screen. Uh, and also this is your exhaust. Uh, we want to make sure we let it exhaust, let the, let the unit breathe. Uh, this is going to be kind of your porch area with the awning and the outside TV and things like that. We want to make sure we're not putting any lawn chairs or anything up in front of this blocking that flow. Uh, it does blow very hot air when it is on. Uh, so again, you will want to make sure that it is breathing properly and we are protecting it from the intrusion of mud daubers and flying insects. Uh, again, not really a customer serviceable unit. Both of these, uh, all your controls are going to be from the inside. So really other than then keeping it, it, uh, keeping it clear and letting it exhaust, there's really not too terribly much you're gonna do here on the outside for either one of these appliances. Uh, outside TV area here, uh, on the inside of the camper, you're going to find a TV mount that's going to mount right here on top. Uh, you'll go ahead and seat the top of that mount first, and then you'll have a little, key, a little button that you can push to overcome that bottom section there and allow that to snap on. Now the idea being is that you're going to use that uh, TV mount, and I thought it might be in that cabinet, but it's not. Uh, you're gonna use that TV mount, uh, so you're gonna get a secondary TV, you're going to install that to your TV mount. Uh, from there, uh, you would then go ahead and apply it here. It goes without saying that that TV is just designed to be used when the unit is stationary. It's not something that you're going to want to uh, drive down the road uh, with that in place. You have your, uh, your sources for your TVs here, uh, whether that's a 12 volt TV, uh, you can power it here. You also do have a couple USBs to charge any uh, devices that you might be using at that time. Or if it's a 110 volt uh, TV, you have a couple outlets here. If you've seen them before, they're just some 15 amp outlets. Uh, potable water here, so I'm probably gonna have to unlock this. Uh, potable water here, so this is where you're going to fill that onboard water tank. Uh, we're going to stick a garden hose directly in there. We're going to fill that up till it overflows. Uh, once it overflows, of course, you're going to cap it off. You do need to use that onboard water tank to pressurize that system and draw that water up to the fixtures. Uh, this is going to be kind of your off-grid or your boondocking option. Uh, you're going to go ahead and use that. Uh, and it's nice that they have one on one side and one on the other uh, to keep you from uh, mixing up the two. Uh, we have your glow step revolution here. Uh, these are really cool steps. You got to unlock them here. And then you have a little lift handle here. From there, you can go ahead and drop it down. Now they do have multiple positions depending on your grade. So if you're on like a really steep on level, you can uh, come down one more uh, setting there. Uh, and then you have the, these kind of scissor out. And then you also have multiple adjustments there when it comes to uh, the height of these feet. So you have little detents on each side uh, and you can of course raise or lower those. Again, really ultimately uh, endlessly adjustable to your grade. So that's why uh, uh, a, a huge upgrade from Lance uh, when they started putting these on their units. Uh, door hold open here, this is gonna correspond, uh, this little hook's gonna correspond with the uh, the catch there that's going to hold that door open uh, in the event that you are using the screen door uh, that's going to allow that to not swing in the wind things like that so. standard RV style handrail locks in the out position you're going to want to lift up and then fold over here uh, a lot of people like to fold against the window as well or against the, the camper whichever you decide is going to work well for you uh, either one is acceptable. Down below here we have your uh, secondary propane port. Now this is a quick disconnect uh, style coupler. You'll slide the locking collar back, insert the male end fully. Once fully inserted it's going to snap back then you go ahead and turn the valve on here. Now this is designed for any high flow propane appliance, any gas grills, any propane heaters, propane fire pits. Uh, you can go ahead and use that quick connect to um, power any of those appliances. So uh, when not in use, it is important that we go ahead and put this rock guard on. That's going to help keep any debris out. Uh, right beside there, we have your uh, gravity feed for your spare tire. Now again, that's going to be a three quarter inch fitting. It's going to be that guy right there. Of course, follow the directions there in terms of direction. Uh, and uh, the idea being you're going to go ahead and crank that down. Once it goes ahead and makes contact with the pavement, you can go ahead and wrestle that tire on out. 
and follow that tire change procedure that we talked about uh, earlier. Um, here in this compartment here, we have a couple tap lights. Uh, so you'll tap right on the lens to go ahead and turn those on. Uh, and that, it, you know, now you can see this uh, drawer. Now this drawer is fully removable. We'll come all the way out. Um, makes it helpful if you, uh, you know, get some sand. If you go to the beach, get some sand in there. You can pull it all out to replace it or to uh, rinse it out. And then you have to make sure that it's locked in before going down the road so your gear's not slamming here into the compartment. Uh, we also have a table under there. Operates just like a standard folding card table, but it is a nice feature and does store well within the compartment. Uh, and then we have another light switch here. This is going to uh, control the LEDs on the left and right side of the tongue, uh, which again is going to be helpful to light any, um, you know, help you light this, uh, your tongue further in the event that you are you know, coupling, uncoupling, or doing any uh, propane work or anything there on the front. Uh, we've kind of seen a lot of this stuff before. We have the other uh, battery uh, compartment there. We have the secondary jack set up here as well. Uh, again, minus the power switch, so you're gonna operate the way that we uh, talked about earlier. Uh, another addition here is going to be this solar port. Uh, now that is a it's designed for a portable solar. Uh, what that means for you is, is, you know, those briefcase style folding panels, any uh, panel that could essentially fit in a storage compartment is going to be considered a portable panel. Uh, with all of those portable panels, the charge controller is built directly into the panel itself. What that does is turn this connection essentially into a plug and play connection. So we're going to plug in here. We're going to pull our panel out into the sunlight allows us to go ahead and utilize solar without having to be parked into the sun. That's why that's a popular option here. Uh, now all lances come pre-wired uh, with solar there on the roof, uh, but this may be a good secondary option for you as well. Uh, just about covers it here on the outside of the unit. We're gonna hop on the inside, take a look at those appliances and features in there. Alrighty, so here on the inside, uh, we're gonna start right up here into the uh, sleeping area. Uh, starting right up front here, we have reading lights. Switch for those lights is going to be right there on the fixture. Uh, down low here, we have a light switch for the backlighting. Uh, and then uh, we have a couple 110 volt outlets on each side of the bed, as well as a charging station on each side of the bed, which is going to have a couple uh, USBs, as well as 12 volt cigarette lighter uh, receptacles there, again, on each side of the bed. Uh, now, folding this jackknife sofa out is very easy. You're going to pull from the front. And then I kind of like to help it down in the rear. So once that's laid out flat, we just go ahead and take your uh, mattress here and go ahead and flip it over. Uh, easy peasy, you got a bed. Uh, from there, now that I can reach it, we'll go ahead and talk about the shades here. You have a pull down shade that's gonna be your privacy option. Uh, then you have your screen option there. Uh, allows you to go ahead and open this window. So here we have the window in the out position. Uh, how we accommodated that is I went ahead and lifted the window out and then I tightened these two struts down. So you have struts on each side of the window. Uh, this is a heavy window, so you do got to kind of uh, really kind of bear down on those struts to get it to hold out. Uh, from there, we can go ahead and pull down either the privacy shade from the top or the uh, screen there uh, to keep any flying insects from, from coming in. Uh, now, when it comes to putting the window down, uh, we're just going to go ahead and loosen these struts up and allow, allow that to lightly come down. Now, if you look here on this window, you have channels here on these latches. Uh, if we go to that middle position here and we were to lock all of those uh, down all the way around the unit, that's going to give you about a fingertips worth of opening here, uh, which is nice to vent the sleeping area. Um, things like that. So you can go ahead and, and latch all of these. Uh, allows you to vent the unit with, with, while still being relatively secure. Uh, now, when we're going down the road, we do need to uh, make sure we are uh, fully locked back here. And we're gonna come all the way back past that plastic there uh, and go ahead and lock those down. Uh, and then just so you can see it, I'm going to go ahead and uh, put this bed back. So we fold the mattress up there. Uh, on the way in, you grab from the rear, help up, and there you go. Uh, it shouldn't take you more than a few minutes to go ahead and make up your bed. 
Uh, one thing I like about this couch uh, is there is storage there on the underside, uh, which is nice. They have Velcro there. Uh, it's a very efficient use of space. Um, now the other windows in the unit are going to be a little bit different. So they're gonna have a fold out pivot point here. Uh, so we go ahead and we fold that out. Uh, from there, we can go ahead and rotate that window uh, out and a different style of shade here. So you do that, you have your screen option there uh, or your privacy option there. These are kind of projector style. So when you want them to go up, you just uh, give them a slight pull and allow that to feed up. Uh, here on this wall, we have your thermostat. Now this is a single mode thermostat, so or single button thermostat to cycle through the modes. Uh, you have a multitude of different fan speeds and it actually takes you into the air conditioning mode. You have cool high, uh, cool low. Now if you're on either just cool high or cool low, that's a set fan speed. That fan's gonna run indefinitely uh, whether or not it reaches its temperature. So to keep it kind of going with, with the temperature uh, that you have in mind where it's gonna reach your temperature and then shut off, you want it to say auto underneath that fan speed. So cool low auto, cool, I, cool high auto. Uh, again, what that means is that we're in air conditioning, the fan speed is high, and with that auto means that that fan's gonna shut off once it reaches uh, that temperature, and in this case, it would be 81 degrees. If we cycle through a couple more modes, that's gonna kick us into that heat mode. Uh, once it realizes what it d we're doing, it kicks that blower motor on immediately. Uh, 16 seconds after that, it actually ignites. By that 30 second mark, it's producing noticeable heat. Uh, within a unit of this size, I wouldn't be alarmed. Within the first 15 minutes of operation, it does actually set off the smoke alarm. Uh, that is inherent of the design of the appliance. Not something to worry about as long as it's happening within the first 15 minutes of operation. So we'll go ahead and turn that off. Of course, we don't need that furnace to be running today. Uh, also in the room, of course, we talked about the reading lights, we talked about the backlighting, but each uh, light switch here in the bedroom is going to be turned on independently. So we have a little slider there uh, to turn that one on, a little slider here to turn that one on. Uh, bringing us here over to the uh, left side of the entry door, we have your switch clusters as well as your awning switch and slide out switch. Uh, first up here is going to be your slide out mood. That's going to be the backlighting there on the slide out. We have your courtesy light here, which is just going to turn on a single light uh, when walking into the unit at dark. It's just a common switch, uh, so you're not fumbling around trying to turn on the, the sliders on the independent light switches. Uh, awning, awning lights, uh, it is on a lighted switch because when the awning is in the in position, you cannot see it. Uh, so if it gets turned on inadvertently, uh, it is nice to, to know. Uh, then we have your patio light switch here. Now this is a three-way switch. Of course, middle position is going to be off, down is going to be a bright white LED light, and then up is going to be like an amber colored, less intrusive bug light. So it's cool to have that multi-positional switch there. Uh, next up is going to be your carefree one-touch awning. Uh, now before I get into the operation of that, uh, you do need to make sure that the entry doors are closed before extending and retracting the awning. Uh, they do give you this sticker here to remind you. Uh, but if you were to happen to forget, uh, you're not going to be the first person. So it is very important to remember that. Close the door, flip this into the on position, and then hit in the direction you want to go. Uh, now, if something jumps out in front of you, if you forget to uh, shut the door or something like that, you can hit that switch. That's gonna, in the, hit the switch in the direction you're going. That's going to immediately stop that uh, awning, and then we can... Uh, either once we move something out of the way or we close the door, we can go ahead and, and continue in that direction by pushing it once more in that direction. Or if we need to back up and start over, we can go ahead and hit it in the opposite direction. Uh, that's going to go ahead and bring it back in. Now, awning is equipped with wind protection. It's very important that the switch remains in the on position when we want that wind protection to be in effect. Now, that wind protection is an excellent feature. It, it works very well, uh, but it's not something that I would necessarily bet my lunch on. This is a very expensive awning. I would not allow any piece of, uh, any piece of technology to uh, make me kind of overly comfortable with it. So anytime you're leaving the campsite, make sure we just go ahead and bring that awning in. Uh, we have your slide in and out room switch here. Uh, we're going to want to come fully in or extend fully on that switch. Uh, avoid halfway openings or a short burst. Uh, hold the switch in the direction you're trying to go until that, that motor stops. So it has an electrical brake on the motor, it's not gonna overextend or anything like that. 
just hold it until it stops making noise essentially. Um, down low here we have your fire extinguisher. Uh, now this is part of your safety equipment. It's very important that we do test your safety equipment uh, anytime we take the unit out. Uh, to do so in this scenario we're just going to go ahead and push that white tab down or excuse me that green tab down. If it springs back that means we have life in the unit. If it stays depressed that means it's time to pull it out and replace. Uh, coming here into the kitchen area, not too terribly much to speak of. Um, multiple sprayers there on the actual uh, sink fixture, and then of course you have the pull down option as well. Uh, under cabinet lighting here is a nice feature of the kitchen. I, I love that. It's on a little pressure switch there. Uh, opens it up when you open the cabinet, turns it off when you uh, shut it. Uh, standard run-of-the-mill microwave here, just like you you use at home, although this one doesn't have a turntable, so you don't have to worry about that turntable uh, rattling around in there. And in terms of function, it's going to function very much like you're probably used to, uh, you know, at home. Uh, same here with the uh, hood vent, your lights, and your fan. That's all pretty basic stuff. Uh, your cooktop here uh, has the fold-up tempered glass top there. Uh, from there, we can go ahead and uh, we would turn this to the flame and then go ahead and, and uh, turn that to actually ignite that burner. Uh, lighting the oven is going to be done in a slightly different way, uh, slightly antiquated. Uh, but just like you would light any pilot light, uh, you're going to, of course, turn this to pilot. And we would hold this button in to get that gas flowing. So we're going to hold this button in. Uh, we're going to need to use a long stem barbecue lighter. So this igniter is only for the cooktop. So once we go ahead and we uh, push it, while pushing this button in, we're going to take our, uh, we're going to take our lighter and we're, there's two prongs in here. Again, it's, it's really hard to, for those to show up on camera, but those two prongs, we're going to put our flame directly in between those while holding this gas button here. Once we see that pilot light lit, we're going to keep this held in for about three seconds after that. Uh, once that thermal coupler heats up, we can then uh, choose a temperature here and allow the uh, oven to heat to that temperature. Uh, main GFI outlet here. Uh, so the, all, the, all the receptacles are on the same circuit within the unit. Uh, if one of them gets overloaded, they all do. So this is going to be the reset point. Uh, just like your uh, bathroom at home, you may have these. Uh, you're going to go ahead and push that red button to go ahead and... Um, reset those receptacles. Uh, down low here we got your carbon monoxide LP leak detector. It's going to be a secondary, uh, again the second piece of safety equipment that we've come to. Uh, this particular uh, detector is wired into the 12 volt section of the camper. Uh, what that means for you is there's no batteries to char change or anything like that. Uh, it does have a test button, again functions very much like a smoke alarm. We have your breaker box, uh, fuse panel box here. Uh, here on the uh, right side of that panel, we have your light switch style breakers. Uh, those are resettable breakers. Uh, you'll probably have a few of those in your fuse panel box at home. Here on the left side of the panel there, we have your automotive blade style fuses. Uh, those are replaceable, so it's not a bad idea to pick up a, a variety pack of fuses. Uh, keep those with the unit in the event that you would need those to be changed. So here we have your convenience center here. Uh, this is going to give you a real-time readout of where your tanks sit uh, as well as your battery. So here looking at the display, uh, the more lights we see, the fuller it is. So if we're looking here, you actually have two indicators here on the left. It's going to actually give you a voltage numbers. You have 12.3, 11.7, 11.2, and low. If we push the button, the battery corresponds with that. Battery's going to read full anytime you are plugged into shore power to get a true readout of where your battery sits. Uh, you need to unplug from shore power and then test here. Uh, then, of course, we have your tank indicators as well. We're going to read that scale on the other side of those lights, uh, empty, one-third, two-thirds full, and then, again, you have your corresponding uh, buttons there. Uh, and then here on the left, we have your water heater switches. Again, I told you you can run on both sources. It's going to give you the highest recharge rate. Uh, next up is going to be gas in terms of efficiency, and then electric in terms of efficiency. Uh, it's important to note that here on the gas side, uh, when we're trying to light that, if we come back later, or you know, five minutes later, and this DSI fault light is lit, uh, that means our water heater did not light. So it may have done that for a multitude of different reasons. 
uh, either your gas valve is closed, either you don't have, uh, you're out of gas, or oftentimes it just hasn't made its way to the, to the rear of the unit where the water heater is located. Uh, in the event that that happens, investigate, make sure your valve's on, make sure you have gas. If you have both of those things, uh, go ahead and turn that off, turn it back on. Uh, generally, it will light on the first try of the second cycle. And then we have your uh, electric side there as well. So moving up here to the refrigerator. Um, they've, they've kind of, their goal was to make this slightly more like a residential refrigerator. So they hid the eyebrow panel within. Uh, what that means for you is you actually need to open the doors to access it. Uh, first up is going to be your on-off switch here. You'll see it kind of do a, a boot up mode there and turn everything on. Uh, this in particular is defaulted to, to propane gas, uh, which is one of the two choices. So you have auto. On auto, it's going to look for AC voltage first. If it does not find AC voltage, it's going to automatically start lighting on gas. So we don't have the unit plugged in right now. That's why it's defaulting there to that LP gas side of things. If we had electricity, it would be running off of 110 volt electricity by default. Uh, and then we have your temperature control here. We have cold, colder, and coldest. So uh, just three modes there. Um, and it does have a scale that tells you uh, that corresponds. Uh, other than that, very much like any other kind of dorm style refrigerator, uh, uh, latches are here uh, on each side of the handle. So you have that kind of recessed handle. Uh, I believe these have this little fold out uh, latch there that keeps that door from closing all the way so if you're uh, storing the unit and you don't want it to get mildewy on the inside uh, you're going to want to keep those doors open uh, to let airflow to it uh, kind of switching around here to this side of the unit uh, we have your dinette of course we have all of those pull down shades as well as your uh, same crank style window there emergency exit is here now uh, that's going to open full out like a doggy door so if you're particularly motivated enough and your entrance is blocked, you can exit out that window. So it's important to note that that is again, your emergency exit there. Uh, we have your dimmer switch here for the dinette. Uh, you also have a hard on off switch on the actual fixture itself. Uh, this dinette makes a secondary sleeping area. Uh, you would wrestle the tabletop from the pedestal here and then separate the pedestal from the flange there on the floor. Uh, once those have separated, you're gonna then take your tabletop allow that to sit here on these slats. We'll go ahead and we'll, we'll, we'll then remove this smaller middle cushion. We would use these two back cushions to fill out that uh, area. And again, it's, it's, you could fit a, 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 an adult sleeper there. Uh, so it is a, a very nice kind of secondary sleeping area. Uh, these lock, uh, these are your drawers. They lock in that out position. So to open them, we go ahead and push that in uh, and go ahead to bring it out. Uh, now you want to make sure you kind of separate those motions. It seems like a lot of people will try and uh, push and pull at the same time. You do want to make sure that's fully depressed before you actually pull. It will, believe it or not, damage the drawer uh, if, you, if you try and do it too quickly. Um, TV area here. Now you're going to find a little black ribbon uh, on the bottom of that television that's going to uh, unlock the mechanism there. And if we go ahead and pull that TV out, and, well, I'm not going to pull it all the way out because we have the slide out like halfway out and it's restricting our uh, range of motion there. Uh, we can see everything that I need to see here on the side there. And that was going to be in my initial reason for pulling it out, but it looks like we don't have to. So. Uh, that little green light we see there, that's going to be your antenna booster. Uh, what that does for you, so you have a little button there, if we turn that on and off, that antenna booster or that green light that actually powers the rooftop antenna. Uh, this unit runs a King Jack antenna, that's going to be this guy right up here. Uh, that actually, that antenna booster actually powers this antenna. Now you have an on off switch here, that's just to turn these lights off. Now these lights, uh, their purpose is your signal indicator. Uh, the idea being is we can go ahead and rotate that antenna uh, until we see more lights here. Once we see uh, all, you know, as high of lights as we're going to see, we would then do a channel search. It's going to go ahead and bring in any available digital over-the-air television. Uh, again, if you find those lights intrusive while you're trying to sleep, you can turn them off. Uh, we're not cutting power to this until we go ahead and we push 
uh, this button here. So once we push that button there, uh, that goes ahead and turns the antenna off. Uh, it isn't always up antenna. There's no travel position. It'll travel in any position. Uh, you know, very straightforward. Um, really, only other things to, to take note in here is, is you have multiple power modes. You have 110 volt outlets up top. You have a 12 volt outlet because it's a 12 volt TV. Uh, again, the antenna booster. And that HDMI port's just connecting the television with the Jensen unit down here. Uh, now, this, the purpose of this Jensen unit is going to be your CD, DVD, AM, FM radio, Bluetooth, as well as the HDMI arcing with the television. So, uh, this has too many features to, to really go in depth with either any of those here in the video. Uh, but one thing I do want to make sure uh, we talk about is your zones. So, and I'm going to turn them all down for now. Uh, you have three zones, uh, two inside zones and one exterior zone. Uh, so when looking at the display, A is going to be the speakers above the dinette. Uh, you have two above the dinette. B is going to be the bedroom speakers. And C is going to be the outside speakers. Again, you control each zone separately. Uh, it's very important uh, that you make sure you're, you're turning the volume up on the correct zone. Uh, you don't want to be you know, broadcasting something that you are intending to play inside outside so uh, other than that you have your main mode button here again that's going to cycle through the modes uh, bluetooth pairing is going to be done with here uh, hdmi arc is going to turn on that television and pair that up uh, in that hdmi arc setting that's going to allow uh, say you were watching digital over the air television that's going to turn this into a receiver essentially allow that that sound to broadcast through the speakers kind of giving you like a surround sound kind of uh, feel uh, again, this carries its own service manual, so I'm not going to spend too much time in the functions of it and, and, and how to use it. Uh, if you do have any questions, don't hesitate to give us a call. Of course, try and read the manual first. Uh, give us a call if, if you have any questions with that. Um, stepping here into the bathroom, uh, you have a pocket door here. Now, this, is, this isn't something that I've seen yet, uh, but it's uh, a cool addition. Uh, instead of having a physical door it's an efficient use of space. It's a, it's a nice addition. I, I like it. Um, and then we have a porcelain toilet here as well, uh, which is very nice. Uh, pedal flush. So a light to press is going to fill up the bowl. Light to press is going to fill up the bowl. Full press is going to flush. Very important that we do keep some water in the toilet at all times. Uh, reason being is because that's going to help keep those bad smells down. Uh, Goes without saying, you're going to need to use a single ply RV grade toilet paper, uh, as well as chemical treatment uh, for deodorizing, uh, tissue dissolving, things like that. If you have any questions on which products to use, feel free to consult our parts department. They'd be more than happy to educate you uh, on the uh, proper products to use. Uh, shower has a little magnetic close, which is nice. Uh, this bend here up top gives you the illusion of having a lot more space than you really do, which is nice. Uh, you have the adjustable shower head here by pushing this button that would allow you to slide that up or down. Uh, and then your switch is going to have an on, or your, your shower head is going to have an on off um, switch as well. What that's going to do is that's going to allow you to conserve your hot water without changing your mix down here. So you'll probably find yourself uh, to conserve that six gallons of hot water, especially you're going to probably find yourself doing military or Navy style showers. Uh, and that on and off switch on the head is pretty useful for that. Uh, only other thing here that we have on the inside uh, of the bathroom is going to be your uh, exhaust fan here. Now that is a 12 volt exhaust fan has a switch here. Uh, we do want to make sure we do close that before going down the road. Uh, and then also, this brings me to the point that we forgot to talk about your fantastic fan here in the bedroom. So we'll uh, wrap up with that. Uh, and that's going to be this guy here. Now, this one in particular actually comes with a remote. Uh, so if I can easily find that remote, that might be worth talking about. So here it is. Uh, this is going to be a remote here for the fantastic fan. Uh, this is like endlessly controllable. So uh, here on the left, I turn it on there, of course, with that blue button there. Here on the left, uh, we're going to control your speed, so you can cycle those down in 10% increments there. Uh, we can set a thermostat temperature there. 
which is a nice feature if you are in the dark or if you're if it's at nighttime you can have that uh, you can set a temperature that fan's going to cycle on and off throughout the night to attain that temperature uh, we can also either bring air in from the outside or if we go ahead and push this it's going to stop reverse and then either bring air in or exhaust it so whichever you choose uh, also is equipped with a rain sensor, so if it does, again, if we're operating that throughout the night with the thermostat, if it were to happen to start raining, it's going to automatically shut down, which is also a really nice feature. Now, this does come with a mount. Uh, you can choose where you mount the remote. Uh, you will find it here in this uh, compartment with all your other uh, important stuff, TV mount, um, remotes, owner's manuals, things like that. That is all going to be on the right side of the dinette. And that just about covers it here on the inside of the 1985. If you do have any questions or concerns, please don't hesitate to give us a call. Thank you.